I don't think introductions are necessary. You all know Larry Albert, and you all know of the eminent man that's sitting here between us. I can tell you, oh, by the way, are we rolling? Are we catching all of this immortally on that? That's wonderful. Uh, I guess my first recollection of you, Norman, was when I was 14 or so. I know I was in junior high school, and your programs, your broadcasts, were considered important enough that the class I was in uh, was, they abandoned the textbooks and listened only to the radio. They had a receiver tuned to probably KNX. And uh, so we listened to Norman Corwin and lived through the war with Norman Corwin and afterwards listened to Norman Corwin's philosophies and watched Norman Corwin's meteoric rise into prominence. And the thought that we were going to be able to talk with him today was kind of like being asked at Monticello if I'd like to meet the original proprietor. <laughs> <laughs> what we'd like to do today is uh, Larry, since Larry is f a past master of uh, uh, details, I was going to say trivia, but it's not trivia, but the details of, of radio and of Norman Corwin's career, I'm going to let, I'm going to encourage you to, uh, to take a big part of this interview. Well, thank you. Norman, <laughs> uh, welcome. Thank you, thank you. It's great, great to, to be here. here. Thank you. Why did you get into radio, Norman? Well, it was there beckoning. And uh, I got into radio curiously through uh, a kind of tropism toward poetry. I loved poetry as a kid. I was influenced by it. I was influenced by poets whom I was too young to understand. Uh, at one time, Keats and Shelley and, uh, of course, uh, the old, our, our representative in, in Stratford. And uh, I just loved the music of it and the sonority. And what meaning did come through to me as a kid was very inspiring. And, uh, uh, however, I did little to advance the art of it. I didn't write poetry. But I was interested in, in uh, its poems. I became a newspaper man out of uh, high school. Where was that? And in uh, Western Massachusetts. I was born in Boston. And uh, I then uh, went to New York. My first job in New York was as a publicity flack for 20th Century Fox Films, whose home office then and now, uh, was then and is now in New York. And uh, there was a station, is, am I going on too long, uh, Jim? That's it's impossible. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a station in New York called W2XR, the, the appearance of a numeral in a station call will date it. Uh, that was uh, a sort of de experimental designation, I guess, W2XR. It's now WQXR and is owned by the New York Times. But then it had no such uh, prestigious uh, management. And I sold them on the idea of doing a program, 15 Minutes of Poetry. And uh, I wrote them a letter saying, you're represented, you, you, it was a station that was commercial, but they did give, uh, the emphasis was classical music. And I was attracted to classical music. And I said, you have programs on ballet, you have programs on this and that, but the oldest art is not represented, the art of poetry. And they said, do you have an idea for a program? And I said, yes. They said, would you come in and audition it? Uh, a 15-minute spot. I said I would do that, and one lunch period, I went over to the station uh, and uh, was received by nobody. There was a little voice that said, uh, would you go into room A? Room A was a closet. The men's room here is bigger than that room. <laughs> and uh, I, I met nobody. And there was a microphone, would you go ahead, Mr. Corwin? So I read what I had written, 
And then I waited, and there was no response. And I, I was a, you know, poor Richard. I had to get back to my job, so I got up and left. Thinking Still I, having not seen a living human not, being. Not a living human being. <laughs> and and uh, I thought, how dismal can one's failure be when they don't even speak to you? <laughs> I got back to the office, and I was there about 15 minutes, and the phone rang and said, what happened to you? We were discussing uh, your, uh, your uh, audition, and we, we like what you had to offer. How would you like to go on the air Tuesday nights from 9 to 9.15. Of course, we can't pay you anything. <laughs> and Nothing has changed. <laughs> and I thought the price was right. <laughs> and uh, I began uh, w doing programs on poetry. Now and then I would sneak in a little poem of my own under a pseudonym. Uh, but uh, that I spill, uh, it, this, the station was none the wiser. The listeners perhaps were. But uh, after about, didn't get much mail, didn't make much of a ripple. But then, at that time, you know, there's a, there's a digital clock here. You can stop me at any time. No, 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 please, continue. Uh, at, at, uh, that time, Spoon River Anthology had not been on the market very long. Edgar Lee Masters' great work. And it had never been adapted to radio. Radio was very young. And so was Edgar Lee Masters. And so was I. <laughs> and uh, I thought that I'd get a few of my friends to enact those marvelous little epitaphs that constitute Spoon River Anthology. So I cast my brother in one of them, and I, there was, there's a Russian, the poem is written in an, in an accent, phonetically, as a Russian would speak. And my, the, the, the tailor to whom I brought my, my clothes for cleaning, spoke could speak no other way. <laughs> and I approached him and I said, how would you like to be on the air? And he was uh, enchanted by this prospect, glory. And so he was one of six or seven uh, actors, non-actors, whom I gathered to put this on. And thanks to Edgar Lee Masters, and I guess thanks a little bit to my choice of the right pieces to go into 15 minutes, it turned out pretty well. Somebody at CBS listened to it. But that wouldn't have been Bill Lewis, would it? Yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Boswell, I, I am in awe of your memory. <laughs> Me too. It far surpasses my own. And uh, uh, they called me in and said, uh, we are looking for a director to direct radio programs. Uh, would you be interested? Interested? <laughs> I was making $50 a week as a publicity flack. Of course, you know, $50 then, what was it, what would it be today? 500 I guess, wouldn't it? Oh, at least. You know, anyway. Uh, I, I was proud of that $50 a week. I, I, I was able to buy a book a week, sometimes a, a, an LP, no, no, LP wasn't in yet, a 78 RPM recording. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I could only make $100 a week, wow. What year was this? I could, 38. See, I remember in 1950, the year I got married, I told my wife if I could only make $100 a week, we would never be able, I would never need a, another raise. <laughs> and I never did get another raise. <laughs> well, what type of program did they offer you at CBS? And this was uh, at CBS, wasn't they it? They did not uh, know me as a writer. They just heard me as a director, mm -hmm. directing words by Edgar Lee Masters. So they offered me a director's job. And they didn't find out I was a writer until several months later. 
And luckily for me, because it took a while, as, as Jim can tell you, uh, the console of, of uh, a radio studio is, is not uh, uh, that simple, you, especially if you get into uh, complicated production. <laughs> and so it took me a little while to, to uh, get wise to what was going on. And then I proposed a program of, of my own. Uh, and that was accepted. And uh, the first script that I wrote, some of you may have heard or remember, The Plot to Overthrow Christmas. What was the, uh, uh, the basic storyline of Plot to Overthrow Christmas? Did you hear about The Plot to Overthrow Christmas? <laughs> well, uh, well, what's the second line? Uh, uh, did you hear about the part of Christmas? Uh, well, uh, listen now from Maine to the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, well, uh, and listen to the story of the utter inglorious and glory goings on in hell. Now it happened in Hades, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it happened in, in, in hell that the fiends held a meeting. The fiends held a meeting for the purpose of defeating Christmas. With, a, uh, with the aid of a fade, a fade on the radio will take you there with a high and a hady hole <laughs> to hear firsthand the brewing of a plot down in the deepest Stygian grot. <laughs> Sotto voce. <laughs> grot is a poetical term for grotto. <laughs> Whenever you hear my voce sotto or sotto voce, whichever you prefer, it's just I taking pains to make quite sure that nobody makes a po poetical illusion which might in any way create confusion. <laughs> I return you now to the voice you were hearing before I had to do this interfering. <laughs> and so on. Uh. Anyway, that, that was my first at bat for an original script. And uh, it awakened a few people uh, this kid from the sticks may be worth uh, listening to now and then. Do you think of yourself beginning as a, well, you've told us you began as a poet, reading poetry, sometimes your own, and you've written poetry in the form of a little tale. What about documentarian uh, efforts? It, you know, if somebody said, Norman Corbin to me, I would say documentarist or documentarian. But that's only one facet. But is it a main facet of your career? No, Jim. Uh, it was one facet, a, a, a conspicuous facet. And I have to confess to you that a very great deal of serendipity was in the mix here. That I came along at a time when the management, the program management at uh, at CBS was, was uh, progressive and open-minded and believed in giving young men opportunities, young people opportunities. And uh, they allowed me to go on with that pro the poetry program. I was never sponsored. I was a sustaining, what they called a sustaining program. And, and so they had to pick up the tab. And then, as far as the documentary area the, to which you refer, Jim, that came along, I, I was lucky in this respect, that when we arrived at the 150th anniversary of the Bill of Rights in 1941, President Roosevelt met with the heads of the broadcasting networks and said to them, this is an important occasion. The Bill of Rights is a very, very precious document. And you guys should get together and put on a program on all four networks, never had been done before. Carry it on all four networks. Uh, and uh, at that time, you know, FDR had a great deal of, of weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they agreed to do that. And they, um, I had 
just been let go by CBS. <laughs> well, now, we're getting a little bit ahead now on the Bill of Rights story. We should save that because it's interesting. After you did the plot to overthrow Christmas, then came some scripts for the CBS uh, Columbia Play, a workshop. Wasn't that correct? No, or, not right away. Not right away. Not right away. But you did 26 by Corwin. That was uh, followed by three years, that mm -hmm. plot to overthrow Christmas. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you wish me to uh, to press that button, I will go to it. Well, you opened a door when you said CBS just let you go because it's very interesting. Ah, yes. Good. I'm glad. Now we, we, we're forming a kind of rough hewn chronology. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was offered, the same man who hired me said to me one day, let me back up. The Columbia Workshop was a very prestigious program that I had nothing to do with. It was so sacred to CBS that it was the property and the habitat of no one writer or director. It was by invitation only. And uh, it was a mark of, of uh, some distinction to be invited to do a program on, on that series. And we even had uh, an exchange with, uh, uh, with the BBC. British directors would come and guest on that uh, Columbia workshop in those days. And then out of the clear, this same man who had authorized uh, the uh, program for which I did on uh, the plot to overthrow Christmas said, how would you like to take over the Columbia Workshop for 26 weeks? Be the resident writer, director, producer. And I, like a hungry salamander, uh, <laughs> snapping at a gnat, uh, could say nothing but, sure. <laughs> and he said, then, if I had had an agent, which I never did, by the way, in radio. He would have, he would have never dreamed of saying to the chief hondo, "Why not call it Norman Cohen's?" Oh, he said, "Take it for 26 weeks." He would have never said, uh, "Why don't you name the give Corwin a proprietary name in this series, 26 by Corwin?" Never he would would he have approached. He'd been thrown out of the building. But the vice president in charge of programs made that proposal on his own. He said, let's call it 26 by Corwin. And I thought, wow. Well, there are two things that emerge here, which uh, people here representing this club of radio aficionados will understand, but I suspect a lot of other people might not. Number one, money is the life's blood of a radio network, as it's the life blood of everything commercial. The fact that Norman Corwin was never sponsored doesn't mean you weren't saleable. It's, it, they placed you above commerce. You were a property representing CBS. Don't deny it, because you really were. And when they would say, let's take this prestigious name we have spent so much time building up, Columbia Workshop, and for half a season, call it, well, actually a season is 13 weeks, two seasons, call it 26 by Corwin, man, you had it made. Did you know you had it made at that time? I knew that I had a chance to make it. <laughs> because uh, to have a series named for you, you you'd break your... Uh, uh, the There's an old Romanian word, Gazaticus. Gazaticus. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jim. Certainly. And, uh, and uh, believe me, it involved the Gazaticus <laughs> very heavily. When I got home from that session, I thought, what have I done? 26 programs, not one of which had anything to do with the program that preceded or would follow it. And I used up my lead time of two weeks on the first show. Thereafter, it was week to week, and when I left that studio at 485 Madison Avenue, at the end of that program, I had no idea what the subject of the next program would be. So only mad dogs, 
and, and you know, idiots uh, and young, eager uh, radio men would accept that kind of a thing. And I did. And it meant a monastic life. I, you know, no plays, no movies, no parties, no dating, nothing. I was there and I worked. Uh, I had the good sense to uh, rent a place out in the country. Uh, you know, like uh, 45 minutes over the George Washington Bridge uh, a rural area so that I would be away from the distractions of the city. And I, I engaged, I was not married, uh, but I engaged a cook who came down from a neighboring town every morning to make my meals and clean the place. And, and I worked. I worked and worked and went in town only to do the shows. Well, you not only had to write the shows, though, you had to cast them and direct them, yeah. uh, organize who was going to do the music live, uh, the sound effects live, the timing, the rehearsals. And the first show of that series, if I remember, was Radio Primer, which is a, <laughs> a satirized look at, uh, satirical look rather, at radio in those days. And uh, uh, had music, singing, it was, a lot of it was in rhyme. And uh, now why do the first show in rhyme and then leave yourself almost virtually nowhere to go for the second one? Well, the Radio Primal was not entirely in rhyme. I, I, I wrote some lyrics for which Lynn Murray wrote the music, and very good music too. Uh, no, they, they, I, uh, there were only two all rhyme shows two that I did. One of the other one, you know, was the Undecided Monarchy. Mm -hmm. no. Since you had so much free reign, and how long were these shows? Half an hour or half an hour? Half an hour. Since you had this free reign, did that give you a wonderful, joyous feeling because of the freedom, or was it scary because you didn't know where the fences were? Both. Huh? Uh, I didn't know where the fences were, but I enjoyed looking for them. <laughs> was, there a, uh, was there a continuity acceptance person at that time at the network? Yes, but I, I fortunately, I, I was given a kind of uh, exempt status. Uh, he never saw this, this stuff. It, that wasn't time. Because uh, uh, some of the programs I finished uh, during a rehearsal break. <laughs> Hear that? Yeah, yeah, really. Not, not too many, but it happened. Yeah. And these were live. Tape was something you put on a bruise. Well, tape had not been heard of. Yeah. Then. Did you do them? Did you do two shows a night uh, for the West Coast and the East Coast? No, we never did that. We it, it, the program. Uh, Jim, I think I think you were uh, too generous in in your estimate of the of what uh, of my value as perceived by CBS at that time. I think I I was uh, a bone thrown to the to the thinking uh, part of the audience, which would care about would have the patience to listen to an all rhyme piece and. Um, uh, they, uh, I was for, uh, 26 by Corwin was scheduled opposite Bob Hope. <laughs> so I was perpetually in the situation of hoping against hope. And, and his program was only the most uh, successful in the history, of, you know, he, he was the number one rating show. And I was against him. But CBS felt that w our audiences were mutually exclusive, and that was fine with them, and it was fine with me. But you did the 26 shows, none of which had anything to do with the previous show. Uh, different cast, different idea, different style of writing for each show. You pulled it off. You only did the one repeat. And uh, shortly after the show was done, uh, what did CBS do? Then uh, uh, a man, a second in command, said to me, uh, the first in command was away uh, traveling somewhere. And he said to me, you know, uh, we, we really uh, we can't afford you. Uh, you're, you're, uh, we love your work, 
and uh, it's nice to accept these the kudos we've got from it but uh, uh, you know uh, commercial necessity is uh, is to be taken into account and uh, and uh, there's there's no we don't have the programming time so I said okay thank you and I phoned my uh, agent. I, by that time, I had an agent for films because Hollywood had uh, was there had been some interest in Hollywood. And I told him, and he laughed. He said, "Well, he said, uh, you don't you know you you need a rest. That's fine." And within a week's time, I got a call from the number one man. And not knowing that the number two man had let me go. <laughs> uh, and he was now, the war had started. The war in Europe, we had The war in Europe. Mm -hmm. And he was now with the OFF in Washington. That's right, Bill Lewis mm -hmm. was with the OFF. And he, ca he called me about the four network program the Bill of Rights program. He said, would you write, direct, and produce a program one hour long to be heard on every station in the country simultaneously on December 15, 1941? And again, that same imbecile who asked, who said, yes, yes, I'll do 26 by Corwin, <laughs> said, yes, yes, I'll do that program. And, uh, that was a hard nut. I didn't have much lead time for it. The, resor the research resources then were pitiful compared to what they are today. They did not even have in the libraries, they didn't have much uh, research literature on, the, on, on the, the American Bill of Rights, would you believe that? And I was in Washington and asked the Library of Congress whether I could come in after hours to search for whatever transcripts there might be of the deliberations of Congress around the time of the formation of the Bill of Rights. And they, they allowed me to, to do that. It came into a very cold Library of Congress and caught a nice case of the flu from that. And uh, then uh, I had very little time in which to knock this out and finished it on the train going from New York to L.A. Uh, and will you allow me, Jim and Larry, to expand and take a little sidebar on that? Certainly. What can they say? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're so, they're so polite and generous men. And I'm, I'm lucky to have be flanked by, by Jim and Larry, I'll tell you that. And uh, that I was on the chief going west from New York, from Chicago, because the war being upon us, uh, there were priorities in flying, the military priorities. So he went by train. Anyway, the script wasn't finished. The date set for it was the anniversary, December 15, 1941. The train stopped, no, the train uh, uh, along came December 7, and I, th there was a program that I had written for the 26 series called Between Americans. It was a, it, it was a, just a look at life in, a, being in America, what's being an American. And it, it was a, a, an easy car going kind of thing the sort of uh, hands-in-the-pocket narrator that uh, also that Thornton Wilder gave, gave us in our town, you know. And, and it had a few little jokes in it, and, but it had dealt with the, the overtones and undertones and middle tones of, of being in America. And it had been done, but uh, earlier, some months earlier, uh, I got a call from Harry Ackerman, mm -hmm. who was writing the Screen Guild Theatre, a commercial program, uh, directing it rather, and he said, we have Orson Welles available on December 7, we'd like to do your Between Americans. I said, fine. 
So, it being, oh, I'm on a train, and it's time for that program. I was still working on the Bill of Rights program. And in those days, I don't know whether they still do it, but uh, uh, you could rent a radio. And they could put, uh, they, they had one of those uh, suction uh, devices with the antenna, you put it in the window of the car, uh -huh. and, and you'd hear the program. So I wanted to hear Orson Welles doing my program. <laughs> and I rang for the porter. I said, I'd like to rent a radio. And he looked at me aghast. He said, what do you mean? Ray? Haven't you heard? And I said, heard what? He says, we're at war. The Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. This is December 7, 1941. Well, when the train, I thought, wow, we're at war. When the train reached Kansas City, I knew there was a 45 minute stop there. And I, I, I run upstairs, up the flight to the station proper, call Washington, find out if the program was still going on. <coughs> but all the circuits were busy, couldn't get through to anybody in Washington. Got back on the train. Oh, and so I sent a telegram asking that question. Uh, are we still in business for December 15? Because all day long, programs had been uh, preempted. Uh, preempted all day long. And incidentally, they had run out of new material by the time the Orson Welles program was scheduled, and it was the first program to be aired after the blackout for uh, war news. So when I speak of serendipity and luck, and it, that made a big impression because the little jokes that were in the piece when it was first done, because we were at war, and now we were talking about what America, you know, means, it had, uh, the, it, it, all the jokes brought there as a studio audience in great roars of laughter, and the reception was incredible. Anyway, uh, when I reached, when the train reached uh, Albuquerque the next morning, there was a telegram. They go through the car calling you, and yes, I'm Corwin. And it was a response from Lewis in Washington saying the president thinks it's more important than ever to continue with that program. Mm -hmm. So I finished it on the train. And on the 15th, one, eight days after Pearl Harbor, it was on every station. More than that. And I, it's incredible what options I had. They said to me, because we were, uh, even when this program was contemplated, we were aware, the country was aware that it was in a, living in a dangerous time, that there might be a war. So they said to me, you can have anybody you want for this play. So when I finished it, I said, well, how about Jimmy Stewart to the narrator? And how about Walter Houston? And how about uh, Edward G. Robinson? <laughs> and I got them all. They so, weren't busy that day. <laughs> well, after the Bill of Rights show, uh, you were asked to do another series of shows from uh, abroad, weren't you? That was uh, a year later, yeah. Uh, Again, when, when Jim asked about the documentary uh, side of my work, again, see, the, the offer came, the, the circumstances required a, a documentary. And at that point, in, in 1942, uh, the fortunes of the British were very low in the war. They had lost El Amain in North Africa in one day's battle. And they were on the defensive everywhere. And the British, it looked as though Hitler was going to be able to cross the channel and, then, and invade England. And it was very rough. And there was a lot of anti-English sentiment in the country building up the fifth column, you know, saying the English will fight to the last American. 
<laughs> That's that, that sort of sentiment. And they said, we'd like a program, again, the White House, we'd like a program in which Americans can meet the British, know our allies. And they asked me if I would do it. And I said, I'll do it, providing that I will not be dictated to, that I will not be told by this government agency and that government agency what I may and may not say, that I'll do it, I'll go to England, which I had not been to before, uh, and write about the English people, about England at war. And they agreed to my terms, and uh, I went. Well, one of the uh common threads through most of your writing that I've found, especially in the English show, I mean, why it's so successful, is that uh, you're cons it's a prestigious uh, Norman Corwin script by this time after the Bill of Rights thing, but there's a thread throughout all of your writing in speaking to and for the common man or the everyday person, which is made, you know, helps make your writing accessible. When you went to England to try to uh, you know, like introduce the British to the Americans. There's a story that uh, you missed a train or you had to sit in some other class of a transportation and you talked to some normal, so regular English people and this gave you your, your idea for the series? Not the idea for the series, but uh, the idea for the opener. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I, an RAF officer got on the train uh, and uh, what was the, I think, Bristol. And uh, they, uh, uh, it, was a lo it was a local, it took forever. And this man uh, saw that I was American and uh, he talked to me about, uh, about the war from the standpoint of, a, of the British and the fighting man. And it was uh, wonderful uh, and I was, I was very much indebted to him for that quality of that first program. Did you, while you were in uh, in London, run into Edward R. Murrow? I not only ran into him, uh, he had to go to the hospital. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. Of course. Uh, he wouldn't be allowed to drive over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They drive on the wrong side. I've been told that, yes. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I shared uh, a, a, an office with Ed Morrow at 49 Hallam Street, a much bombed uh, headquarters, by the way. That building not, it wasn't selected by the Nazis to, to bomb, and they didn't know that CBS had, a, had taken over the building. It was a tenement building. And I uh, was with Ed for the, and Ed was in a way associate producer of that program. He was of enormous help to me. I said to him at one point, I'd like to do, you know, London, you have, we have wonderful correspondents uh, busy in London and telling us the, the London, the, the war of the Londoners. But what about your little towns? Would you nominate for me? a town that I could go to, to cover, to project small town England fighting this war. And he, he, he mentioned Cromer, and I went there, and it's one of the best, pre, best scripts from my point of view I've, I've ever done. It was a simple, true document. I want to get into some of the writing that you've done. When you give voice to a character, whether this is a character who lived or lives or if a composite of people that you assume live or entirely the figment of your imagination. Do you hear their voices? Yes. Uh, especially if I know who, for whom I'm writing. For whom? Uh, for which actor? Martin Gable, for example, or Orson. Uh, I was able to, able to write for Gable. Uh, and uh, I knew what he sounded like. I knew Did you do that on purpose just now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought so. Uh, it deserves contempt. <laughs> More to be pitied. <laughs> but uh, uh, he had a great uh, capacity for 
irony and for um, emotional charge in his delivery. And that script uh, called for it and those qualities at times. And uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful actor to work with. When you wrote for Orson Welles, was he exhibiting then the, the uh, big range of uh, dramatic delivery that I think of him as being capable of? Or was he, was he not uh, as yet displaying such uh, depth? He was pretty young. He was young, been, but, from, but from the go, from the word go, uh, Jim, he was, uh, he was pretty puissant. Yeah. He <laughs> was just, uh, uh, let me give you a little detail to answer that. When we did uh, the Bill of Rights show, if I can come back to that, uh, these were done live. Today, the, the, the stars would show up uh, at their convenience and you'd put it together later. But everybody had to be in that studio, except Orson, who was on location. He couldn't help it. He was bound by contract and he was on location and he, we knew he would be late. Now, Orson in that piece has a kind of aria. It's a very emotional bit. And uh, we were into the dress, started the dress rehearsal. All these stars there. And there was no Orson. And uh, just about five minutes before his scheduled appearance, chronologically, in the script, Orson came in all a bustle, you know, uh, he had hurried to get there. And as he came through the door, my assistant who had been on, on the lookout for him had the script ready to the page and everything and handed him the script as he came in. And he came up to the mic and read it cold. And that reading was so powerful that all of the, those great stars who had been established a long time before Orson came on the, into the scene. Lionel Barrymore was among them, and uh, what, did I mention Walter Houston? And, yeah. and, and Rudy Valley even sang a little Jeffersonian bit, uh, and uh, it was just glittering with stars. When he finished that reading, they applauded. Now that was very seldom that you, a rehearsal was interrupted like that. Orson, uh, uh, when we were on the air, Orson, charged up by that reception, began too high. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. So uh, if you hadn't heard the previous reading, it was fine. But uh, I, my heart sank, you know, four centimeters. Uh, when, when he started so high, I knew he'd have nowhere to go. <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, I want to ask you about other things you did during the war for the air. Uh, there must have been many. And does anything in particular stand out for you? Well, I lean on Larry. Uh, well, Columbia uh, presents Corwin. Larry has the uh, raison, uh, the uh, raison a. Well, once I figure out what that word means, I'll uh, it's, let it's me, a breakfast roll, let breakfast me know roll with raisins on it. Let, let me know what you do. Okay. Well, you did uh, Columbia Presents Corin, which was another series of scripts for uh, Columbia, the Columbia Workshop. Again, none of the scripts were to have the same theme. This was in 44 and 45. Well, yeah, I didn't mean, to, didn't mean to be coy in my answer to you, Jim. Uh, Yes, I did other ways. <laughs> uh, Untitled with Freddie March, which in 1944, before the war ended, was a bit of a tune-up for On an Order of Triumph in that the theme of it was, what are you going to do with the victory? The responsibility of victory. <clears throat> and it was a stark program with a great score by Bernard Herrmann, who also did the score for On and Out of Triumph. And Bernard Herrmann has, since his death a few years ago, 
has, has unfortunately with so many artists they're, they're recognized they begin to be recognized properly after they die well, I know that, <clears throat> that was certainly the case with me but I would <laughs> 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 When the war was over, did Columbia look to you to put an exclamation point to the end of their wartime broadcasting, in which CBS, I must say, was very distinguished? Not as such. The only time they asked me to put an exclamation point or a period to a phase was on the occasion of their 50th anniversary. And that, by some, uh, uh, a skull session, skullduggery we'd call it, last night, I was telling, uh, telling uh, Jim that it's not been published, and uh, perhaps uh, in my closing moments, uh, you will give me permission to read it to you, it's a short piece. But uh, n they did not ask me, yes, wait a minute. I'm they did ask me to write a program on 24 hours notice <laughs> on the surrender of Japan, which came suddenly, you know, the bomb was dropped and there, was, there were negotiations and, and unlike the uh, unlike the uh, Honor Note of Triumph, which was delayed by the Battle of the Bulge, uh, this was sudden. So overnight, I said, I can't give you any full panoply program. I can give you a program for two voices, maybe, for 15 minutes worth. And they said, we'll take that. And I did, and Orson Welles and Olivia de Havilland were the two voices. Yeah. And I will say this that just this last year, year uh, was the 50th anniversary of the surrender of Japan. And I was asked by NPR, a corporation for public broadcasting, to memorialize that and did with Charles Kowalt as my narrator. And uh, that's, that's a, an okay program, uh, from my point of view. Uh, Larry and uh, and Bill Bill uh, Brooks can tell you more. But now you mentioned on a note of triumph a few times, and uh, for people who are listening, will be listening in, or are listening in, who are not familiar with that show, that was commissioned by who to commemorate what? By the very man who let me go at CBS. <laughs> Douglas Coulter came to me and said, uh, it looks as though well, there'll be a touchdown in, in the European war pretty soon. We'd like to preempt an hour of prime time on the day that that happens. Uh, will you get to work? Uh, stop, I was now in the 22nd of a series that succeeded 26 by Corwin called Columbia Presents Corwin. <laughs> and uh, I had done the 22nd of those, and I had four to go, and he said, would you stop your work on that series and prepare something to be ready for the night of victory in Europe? That's how that happened. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> it would have been done, it was done live. They did not oh, transcribe yeah. it. No, that's right. Now you were writing on the script, and as you were telling us, and uh, but they put it on hold because of the Battle of the Bulge. That's right. The last German offensive. That's right. And the show was to be broadcast the day the Germans surrendered. That's right. Live. Yeah. Hour long show. That's right. It opens with Martin Gable and uh, talking about, again, the common, how the common man, the everyday man, defeated the super soldier. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, was it ever repeated? Mm, yes, a week later. Well, I'm just curious about the logistics here. Nobody knew exactly when the show would go on the air, but it, it was on a moment's notice, almost. That's right. So you had all these stars, you had musicians, sound effects men, producers, all of the people who uh, labor behind the scenes, and without whose labor no show would be on the air, standing by. 
What were yes. they doing? Sleeping uh, on cots in another studio? No, no, no. Well, when in the last week before it became official, there had we were prepared in the sense that Martin Gable. I was out of here. Uh, and I was. I mean, here. I was in uh, in Hollywood. Close enough. <laughs> I had just finished doing a big program, an hour-long program, in San Francisco to commemorate the opening of the United Nations there. Remember, in 45, shortly after FDR's death. And a week later, I went, I went from there to LA to await developments. They sent Martin Gable from New York to wait with me here. The score had been completed. There were not stars, Jim, uh, unlike the Bill of Rights show. The, the others were after actors, uh, uh, many of whom uh, you both know and have used. Uh, and uh, um, it, it, the standing by was no great task. Well, that's noted as your masterpiece at least in most of the writings that I've, I've read concerning your career, did you, uh, or do you feel that was possibly your best work? Well, it was the best known work. Uh, I think I did other pieces that were, that were in the same ballpark. Um, one of them was called The Long Name None Could Spell, about the occupation, the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And another one was untitled, which has been mentioned. Uh, but th they were, there were several, of course, the whole English series. Uh, there was quite a lot of war uh, <coughs> radio. So much so that when it came time to do On Another Triumph, I was stumped. I thought, you know, where am I? What? What have I, uh, can I say that I haven't said? And uh, I made some false starts on that. And uh, then I picked up, I was seeking inspiration. Uh, walking in the park and going to a museum and listening to music and, and reading some of the atrocities of the war to get myself in an emotional anger. Uh, all of these things, and I would make start after start and, uh, and abandon it. And then I read Whitman. I picked up Whitman, and there was a, a poem he wrote right uh, after the Civil War. And the line in it, there was a line in it, never were such sharp questions asked as this day. And I thought, Lots of sharp questions to ask about this, the end of this war. One thing, Jim, Larry, I knew that the war was not going to be over, that the war in Europe will, would have been ended. But our sons and brothers and fathers, and uh, they were still at risk of their lives, and there would be men dying. We didn't know about the atom bomb then. And I knew that there would not be dancing in the streets, not while the war was continuing. And we were facing a very difficult, stubborn, uh, iniquitous enemy. And uh, so it, it was not a flag-waving piece. It was, a again, as I, I mentioned, that Untitled was a, a little prelude to this. Again, the, who have we beaten? What did it cost to beat him? What have we learned from this war? And is it going to happen again? And these questions are asked at intervals, and the answer to those fill in the, the open spaces. The show closes with a prayer, uh, rather about a three, two to three minute prayer by Martin Gable, and then the show goes off. And uh, we were talking last night about a story that you had related to someone else uh, several years later. And uh, regarding the power of this piece, uh, Mr. Corwin was on a uh, plane flying to London from yes. the United States and in first class. And in those days, as he's 
told me they used to put your name on the uh, seats and there was Corwin, last name, and the pilot came out and saw the name Corwin on the seat. Parenthesis. I was flying on movie company business, hence, <laughs> hence first class. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you let him tell that story? And why don't you finish the story, Mr. Corwin? What? Why don't you go ahead and finish? Well, well, Larry does song. such a good song. job. Song. You know, I sit back and relax, and, <laughs> and I, 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 I have, it's in good hands. Well, I'll finish it, and then I'll never tell another story again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it struck me uh, to uh, how powerful this piece was, and how he seems to he said it's a good piece. You know, it's many years later, and the pilot came out, and he saw the name, and he asked Norman. He said, "Are you?" Uh, Mr. Corwin, he said, yes, sir. You related to Norman Corwin. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I am Norman Corwin. And without another beat, the pilot started reciting the prayer from the end of On a Note of Triumph mm -hmm. that he had heard many years ago. And this was the type of influence that this man had had on him or his writing. Norman, you had something you wanted to read. Yes. Before that, may I pay a special tribute to those of you who come out, not only today, but you had guests in the past and will in the future, you are, to me, the aristocracy, that you are keeping the flame bright and burning. So is Jim in his work, and so is Larry in his work, so is Bill, but it is your interest that keeps this medium, this once beautiful medium, unprecedented in its character. When I say unprecedented, television is the is uh, child of movies. The same technique, I mean, uh, different, uh, different <coughs> electronics, but uh, lenses and cameras. But radio came along without any overture, and it is a medium for a blind audience. And Bob Herman is here today, and ask Bob, and he'll tell you how important it is to hear images and to be our own set designer. And uh, as to the, uh, forgive me for that preamble. No, I think we you, were all glad to hear you. You asked uh, a, a, a question about the piece. That, yeah. This is a piece, uh, CBS 176? 77. 77. Was 50 years old. And they planned a week-long celebration of that anniversary on television. Four hours the first night, three hours the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and the last night another four hours, ending with uh, uh, an, an end piece, an epilogue. And they came to me and asked me to write it. And. Uh, I did. Walter Cronkite read it. It has not been published, and uh, I brought it along because it kind of, it sort of speaks to to space communications radio and its successor. First, a panel lit up, reading on the air. A shingle hung out in the sky, denoting open for broadcast. Then, words and music. That embarkation is barely started toward Andromeda, cruising at the speed of starlight, and already we are ripe for jubilee. Babes born on that night show gray, show wrinkles where they should be showing, are not as fast afoot as once they were, but since they ride together with us on the float we call our home, they join the party. 
Years of the electric ear, the heavens crackling with report, far-flung, nearby, idle, consequential, the worst of bad news and the best of good, seizures and frenzies of opinion, the massive respirations of government and commerce, sofa sitters taken by killer cycle to the ballpark, the concert hall, the scene of the crime, dramas that let us dress the sets ourselves, preachments and prize fights, the time at the tone, the weather will be, and now for a word, the coming of wars and freeways, outcroppings of fragmented peace, singing commercials, and the Messiah. And then the eye, Cyclops, the one-eyed giant put to work as picture maker, two uncountable galleries, no longer the imagined but the living face in the glowing mosaic, not only the tap of the dancing foot but the swirl of the twirling skirt, not only the bounding arpeggio but the dazzle of running fingers. No eye has roved like the video eye, away and beyond the reach of earth, out to the moon and onto it, footprints in primordial dust, umbilical walks in the deeps of space, sprayed on the tube in front of the chair or up on the wall in the bedroom. Blood, too. Between that night and this, the cruelest half of the cruelest century. The resentful atom, furious when provoked, depots of extermination, bomb blasts and body counts, corpses on campuses, terror the diplomat, Olympic torch flaring over a funeral beer, gun sights on the boulevard, the motel, the motel porch, the hotel kitchen, the parking lot, murder on camera, the shot seen round the world. Is it any wonder the eye of Cyclops from time to time was bloodshot? But look out across the anniversary. Antennae like stubble on rooftops, drawing light and shadow and polychromes out of the general yonder. Galvanic cl clouds raining anchormen and action. In-laws of the sitcom, outlaws of the West, contagions of laughter, pandemic widows of the football weeks, guesses and giveaways, riches on the instant, Cinderella liveth, the stubborn noble enterprise of human rights, whodunits and doves, hawks and ferrets. Now, sir, will you tell the committee, well, sir, at that point in time, protocols of mayhem, animated mice, men, messages, by authority of the commission. Babes born on this night will, by our second jubilee, find few of us now here, still in the flesh, but all summonable out of silence. To you then, sons and daughters, members of tomorrow's weddings and the families to follow, play us back not as a quaintness, but a memoir of a contentious time. Sift our past, and you will find among the gravel gemstones of a kind. But do not dwell on us. Instead, enter the future as the future enters you. And what you see, the lens will see. And what you do, the ribbon will record. And what you say, be stored with every inflection in its place. In cribs tonight, what ballerinas playing with their toes? Yowling for the nipple, what incipient Homer? What toddler picking up her dolls and baubles will write a poem or find a cure to make an epoch happier? Who on a scooter car will transfer to a wagon set for Mars? Meanwhile, Cyclops will not be indifferent, 
for he is worked by mortals made of malleable metals, and glass can weep, and dust fall on a lens. This is the eye in which our inheritors will see themselves as in a vibrant mirror with all their pores and passions. We whose celebration runs out in this hour send you denizens to last you to the year 2000 and far beyond. May you give shelter to the muses. Melt down your barriers. Pay no more dues to war. Make liberty a cult, and love of liberty a deep addiction. Adorn yourselves with sunny aspects and ornaments of honor. There end our greetings, but we must send a postscript to Andromeda. When at last this reaches you, know that it went out from a small planet with one moon and a billion families, a globe with salted oceans and green mantles. We on this spinning outpost share with you the same infinity of time and space. So when you spot us on your sets and tune us in and ponder what you see and hear, we ask this only, that you do not judge us yet for there is more to come. Dave, let's just keep it rolling because we may pick up something from the audience. Would you like to answer sure. some questions? <coughs> oh, fine. <coughs> Stop tape, please. <laughs> Go for it. There are several echelons here. Roll again. I'm taking charge. Get to keep the tape rolling. Yes, sir. Thank you, General Haig. <laughs> he had more hair. During the late 1930s, Charles Lawton was having a lot of problems with films that he was in. He had some problems with Garson Keenan that had been written about, and of course, there's a classic failure of Ike Claudius to become completed. But uh, during the 1940s, he worked in, uh, in some radio and did some wonderful shows for you. What was uh, your experience with him, and how do you think uh, radio acting affected him? We have to stop one second. Uh, if you have a question, please come to the microphone. Otherwise, I have to repeat the question for the tape. And it's basically, uh, the question was, how does Charles Lawton, how was it working with Charles Lawton, Norman? Uh, you know, this man who was so formidable as Captain Bly and uh, was such a heavy, uh, played Nero, he was a pussycat. <laughs> he was very sweet. And he, he was uh, modest and uh, he wasn't at all uh, uh, sure of himself. He, he would uh, sometimes plaintively uh, ask how, you know, an approach to something. and. Uh, uh, he was just as sweet as he could be. You wrote a piece for him called uh, To Tim. To Tim at 20. To Tim at 20 about uh, his son. I'm sorry. Get that over there. It was to be delivered to his son after 20 years. Yeah. And uh, what was the premise of that? Well, a, the premise was a British flyer who was sent out on an assignment from which he knows there can be no return. And he has a, a, little, a little boy, a little son at home, who's maybe three or four years old, and he, he writes a letter to be delivered and read by that son when he gets 20, when he's 20 years old. And it's called To Tim at 20. And to go beyond that is to, it's a short piece, I'd be, be giving you the whole piece, and <laughs> that's not in the rules. Uh, that would be thrown right out of court by Bill and 
Jim and Larry. <laughs> oh, oops. Sir. NPR recently did a reprise of several of your shows, but I thought it was called 13 by Corwin. Yes, they call that reprise 13 by Corwin. <laughs> <laughs> the original, there was never a 13 by Corwin except as a book. And, uh, but the original series was 26 by Cohen. You're quite right. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Terry. Uh, reading a critic's review of uh, the Star Wars uh, resurrection, he was, he, the critic said in the paper yesterday or the day before that he was really, uh, was nice that he did, uh, that Star Wars came along, but he, he regretted it because he thought Star Wars sort of did away with movies as they were developing the 70s. Well, that same thought occurred to me about radio. Well, why couldn't radio survive in the face of television? What did we do wrong? Well, uh, uh, the answer to that, I'm afraid, is uh, um, a bit uh, discouraging. Uh, radio, you see, television is much easier to assimilate the viewer can be, can be uh, lazy and, and can suspend the usual powers of discrimination. He doesn't exercise them. In radio, there was no term the equivalent of boob tube. <laughs> there was no term the equivalent of couch potato. And that's because the radio audience participates. It thinks. The piece I just read to you, which you received so cordially, is a thinking piece. It, it's not, uh, hey Joe, what you doing tonight? <laughs> and uh, radio beckoned to the, to the poet, really, in the same way that a silent organ beckoned to J.S. Bach, and a blank wall beckoned to Diego Rivera. Uh, there was this marvelous canvas, that marvelous canvas that Larry uh, spoke of, where 25 years after you've done a program, in the middle of the Atlantic, in the middle of the night, a uh, uh, captain of a, sh of a plane comes by and says, uh, and, and reads some lines to you that were written to be done once, 25 years ago. So, you know, television, television is uh, very, very seductive. It, uh, it, 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 it uh, absorbs the, the attention of, of uh, school kids. The, more, the statistics are that children spend much more time watching television than they do doing homework or, or at their studies. And uh, radio did not have that same hold. In fact, radio, look, I, I have to make a little allowance here. There are very good things in, in television. Uh, islands and archipelagos <laughs> uh, of excellence. But the mainland is public television, where they at least have a conscience and where they can do conscionable work and they're not cramming auto chases and uh, Howard Stern down your <laughs> throat. Well, we have now, though, uh as Jim told me last night, we have proof that radio drama is still alive because with Jim's program, the Carver Mystery Playhouse, he was informed yesterday that he now has five times the audience on his time slot, nine to ten, Saturday and Sunday nights, than the second station. Well, I'd like to defend myself if I may. <laughs> no, you see, this doesn't speak to the excellence of the programs. I wish that, that I could believe it did. It speaks to the paucity 
of that kind of program. If, to put names to it, uh, Colby Chester, who recently mounted a very expensive production uh, with live music, I understand, and uh, an adaptation of a very popular fiction writer's work here. I know them all, and uh, I'm glad they did it. And what I would hope is that it doesn't flare into existence on public radio and disappear. It will. It was intended to. What we need, so that those rating figures won't be so absurdly top-heavy, is other stations to say, okay, French is successful with, the, with radio plays, but he does detectives and he does little dramas. Why can't we dramatize something out of history? Why can't we dramatize a big event in sports? Why can't we bring back bring the same techniques to other interests in life and let that phenomenon that we're all familiar with, that is the only reason you and I are here in this room, the phenomenon of the mind's eye, the theater of the mind, imagination, whatever you want to call it, uh, let it be stimulated and sparked again, and it's inevitable that it will succeed. There is no way it cannot succeed because it's part of our physiology. It's built into us. To be able to take sounds and make pictures without worrying about the millimeter of the film or high, dent, high whatever it's called, HDTV, <laughs> hot dog TV. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? That's why. Oh, he. <laughs> Does anyone know this guy? All right, Bill. Gordon, you told us an interesting story last night about a friend of yours, Bob Lee, and the production that his wife, Janet Waldo, did. Could you give us a little background on that and tell, tell the audience the Janet Waldo story about doing the last letters of Robert Lee? Uh, Janet Waldo was, is the widow of Robert E. Lee, who was a co-author of Inherit the Wind and Auntie Mame and other very successful uh, plays later made into movies. And Bob, uh, uh, having the name Robert E. Lee, was naturally interested in a general by that same name. <laughs> and uh, the last work he did before he died untimely two years ago, was a fictional uh, collection of letters called The Lost Letters of Robert E. Lee. Lost, L-O-S-T, not last. And uh, Janet, whom you perhaps know best as Corliss Archer, uh, and who is still very much uh, alert and uh, working in radio. Uh, Janet uh, takes the role, she adapted it from uh, the, a novelized uh, form of, of the collected letters, and she, uh, it, it's an exchange of letters between her, a northern a Yankee girl whom Robert E. Lee meets early in his uh, cadet days, and uh, it looks as though that's going to mature into uh, a, 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 an impressive relationship. Uh, they might even marry. When, uh, for reasons of social obligation and uh, caste, C-A-S-T-E, uh, he, uh, Robert E. Lee, does a right angle turn and marries one of the, uh, the woman he did marry, uh, was she a descendant of, uh, the, of uh, related Mary to Custis? She was the Custis. granddaughter of Grand uh, Martha Washington. Yeah. And this is very bad news for the young lady. Her, she marries. Her husband uh, uh, is a, m a medical officer. He's captured, taken to Andersonville, that terrible Confederate prison, and dies there. And all this time, sporadically, uh, the, uh, the Corliss Archer, the w woman, 
played by Corliss, by uh, Janet, is riding Lee, and she at one point reaches a great peak of emotion in which she takes it out on Robert E. Lee for commanding the Confederate Army and uh, for war in general. And it was so, she threw so much passion into it. I, I narrated, I was asked to narrate it. And um, in dress rehearsal, she was so powerful in that scene, that letter, just the speaking of that letter would, that I, who do not uh, uh, lose my uh, composure uh, that easily, I'm sorry, I lose my position easily, <laughs> but um, I, I couldn't go on. I, I, we had to have a break in the rehearsal. I was too choked up. That's what uh, the, the voice unadorned, unaccompanied can, can accomplish, if the words are right. What are you uh, doing now? Uh, ad addressing work? a most distinguished audience. <laughs> I really hate that when you do that, Norman. I, you know. <laughs> uh, what uh, what act projects are you involved in? I'm doing a series, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> I'm doing a series uh, 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 funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. They commissioned me to do six plays, radio plays, within an 18 month period. One has already been done. Uh, the second one goes on the air sometime in February. Uh, the first one is called No Love Lost, and it has to do with a, yes, I thought he was giving me a sign, you know. Uh, the, uh, the first one uh, has to do with a, uh, the, the, the only suspension of disbelief is that Hamilton, Jefferson, and Burr were together one evening in a kind of town hall appearance <laughs> to explain uh, uh, what uh, course we should take in the then impending war with France. It looked at one time as though we would go to war with France only, only 20, 30 years after we'd beaten England with the help of France. And um, then they get on to other matters. It's a, they have a moderator. And I'll give you some idea of the cast which will support what Jim is saying about, about uh, radio not uh, turning, you know, uh, not uh, lying recumbent. For that, for that program, my cast consisted of Lloyd Bridges as uh, Hamilton, William Shatner as Jefferson, uh, um, Landau, Martin, Martin, Martin Landau Martin. as the moderator, and Jack Lemon as Aaron Burr. Pretty good. And we did it before a live audience at the new Museum of, Tele of Television and Radio in Beverly Hills. And uh, the second, which uh, as I say will be on the, mo on the air momently, uh, is about Miguel de Cervantes. This being the 450th anniversary this year is the 450th anniversary of his birth. And uh, I was attracted to this by the realization that, that Don Quixote is the most widely published and translated book today and in the history of books, second only to the Bible. Don Quixote. So, and uh, Charles Durning play, shall plays the role of Cervantes. And I have a big cast, including Ed Asner and Shatner and Samantha Egar and, uh, and Charles Shaughnessy and uh, uh, wonderful people. So, you know, they're still attracted to, to radio. The third is a comedy with Carl Reiner, Shatner and Egar. Reiner plays three roles, he triples. 
and the three rows succeed themselves, each other. The first one doesn't succeed anything, but the second and third do. <laughs> um, and uh, that's, that series is, is half done. I have the rest to write. There is a person in this room who can do that. His name is Frank Buxton. Yes. He is a, uh, he is a budget keeper's dream. When I have a budget for five actors and I have eight roles, I hire Frank Buxton. <laughs> must give me his telephone number. I'm sorry to have to interrupt. We're going to have to take a break. Uh, for Mr. Corwin, that uh, you, you've thought up during the break? I have a question, but I don't want to ask it if there's somebody else. <laughs> How, let, let Marty ask it then, Paul. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, music's very important in your your programs, and a num one of the composers you, you used a lot when you could was Bernard Herrmann. How was he to work with, and was he a lot different than Lynn Murray, and how did you get together with your composers to, uh, to figure out the music for the plays? Bernard Herrmann was um, one of the very best. Many considered him the best of the radio composers, and he was uh, shrill. Uh, he was um, um, a bit um, abrasive uh, because he felt that uh, music should have uh, proper acknowledgement. Uh, and uh, this expressed itself even more when he got to write music for films. He wrote the music for Citizen Kane. He wrote the music for the Alfred Hitchcock films, Psycho, and uh, one or two of the others. Uh, he was uh, very, he was a good a personal friend. Uh, I, my wife and I saw him through uh, a, a divorce, and a marriage and a divorce, and, and uh, we understood each other. I never had any uh, temperamental problem, te problems of temperament with Herman. Uh, I trusted him. He knew what he was doing. I once told him um, when, uh, in those days, CBS had what they called a house orchestra, that is to say, a group of men who would be available to hire by commercial programs and would be available sometimes to sustaining programs like mine. And we, the size of the orchestra would differ from week to week. And uh, it was only rarely that we had the full complement of 40 or 50 men. And I did one program where um, I learned in advance that we were going to have the full orchestra. And I called Herman and said, good news. And he had re received the script. And he said, who wants the full orchestra? I, I have, uh, this is a script that requires six men. And I said, what do you mean, six men? What's the orchestration? He said, uh, four harps, a timpani, and a piccolo. And believe me, he knew what he was doing. <laughs> it was magic. That's the kind of trust you can ha afford in a man like Homer. Paul? Great. Uh, well, my question Paul. is... Paul. Oh. No, 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 Paul. Oh. Microphone. <laughs> um, this is uh, similarly related. Uh, it seems in your broadcast you make uh, a greater use of music that was made, than was made in many other radio presentations. Uh, did you find that you had any... Uh, th that other people would come to you and ask why you use so much music or complain about the fact did actors ever complain about the idea of working with musicians only one and curiously since he'd been mentioned earlier it was charles lawton and he uh what happened is that remember deems taylor deems was a commentator and a composer and i adapted the book of job 
as one of the programs on one of the series. And Deems Taylor, who was a friend, wrote the score for it. And it, it uh, unnerved Charles. He had a tough time with that particular score. And it's the only time there was ever any problem. But I've been very, very lucky. Uh, again, uh, the, sing the series I did from England had as its composer to do my uh, all of the all of the chores of the scores. Benjamin Britten. <laughs> Benjamin Britten. And uh, <clears throat> not uh, not available because he had since long gone to the shades. The program that was mentioned earlier, that Charles Corralt narrated, uh, uh, called the 50 Years After 14 August, the Surrender of Japan, we could not afford for that program an original score. So I thought, what am I going to use? You know, I have a record, uh, you know, an LPL uh, library of about 2,000 records, and I thought, my God, I'll spend longer searching for the music for this thing than I will have done uh, writing it. But the second disc that I picked up served my purpose, and you will never believe that it could fit that particular work. And I commend you uh, to listen to it for the music alone. And that was a score by Villalobos, the Brazilian composer. He wrote a symphonic poem called Wirapuru, based on uh, based on an Amazonian Indian legend. I gave it to my wife for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted there, a car. <laughs> the, <laughs> she likes the music better. <laughs> the uh, there is an elegiac uh, ending to this piece that goes on for a bit to the, uh, 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 the mourning that those young men who died in that war. One lies at the bottom of an arctic deep, and one lies with an ocean across his chest at the bottom of an arctic deep. Another, you know, the son of the postman lies in a jungle roots tangle his feet. The turtle is young at 81, but the flyer is dead at 19. That kind of a passage, you know. Mm -hmm. And music from Villalobos uh, reinforces that, and it's the music that makes it. It is that great. Music is, is a, a friend and ally of, of radio. Well, they, what your first series was called Words Without Music. <laughs> For budgetary reasons. Very first program, Words Without Music. I beg your pardon? The very first program that you did back in Massachusetts, wasn't that with music? Yes, how did you know that? Yes, I did. Uh, it was called, um, no, that was called Poetic License. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it had music not accompanying, but complementing. I would read a piece and to be followed by music. So they, they never, they never. Any other questions? Another question, yes? How do you feel poetry? Would you, yeah. How do you feel poetry has influenced your work? Uh, I think it has had the greatest influence of my work. Uh, I, can, I can trace my indebtedness to clearly uh, to several writers, uh, Whitman, Sandberg, and uh, of course with uh, great uh, support from all the, all the great poets uh, that are in print. Emily Dickinson, I love with a passion. Try to date her, it was too late. <laughs> you mentioned that you pulled, you were stuck for an idea, and so you read some poetry and it gave you the thought. Now how do you feel about being the author of things when somebody is stuck, Corwin's ideas give them a thought? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I feel like a proud grandfather. 
But uh, <coughs> I, I, I'm moved by that. Um, I remember, though, at one time in one publication or other, Max Wiley, who was a story chief or a continuity chief at CBS in those days that I was talking about, Bill of Rights days, gave, uh, wrote a piece advising writers, don't write like Corwin. <laughs> not, not because he, he uh, uh, had any aversion to, or hostility to my writing, but he said uh, you have, uh, he has too many imitators. So uh, I suppose that was a kind of backhanded uh, form of flattery, but. Uh... <laughs> there are, there we could do a whole other interview with Norman Corwin on just his philosophy on writing and words and uh, artistry without going, even going into history. But Charles Corralt, who I admire tremendously as a writer and a commentator, said that occasionally he writes something and he stops and he looks at it and he says, that's Corwin-esque. <laughs> and he loves it. He says, I, I can write like Norman, uh, one line, one phrase, Corwin-esque. And if you ever listen to Charles Corralt, direct influence. It is Corwin-esque, and to be a writer and to, be, uh, and to think you can do that or hope you can do that, based on what this man has written, and if you listen to it, well, it didn't get better. It didn't, there, you know, there may be some comparable, but it didn't get better in radio, in my no, opinion. Corralt is a marvelous man, man and, and artist. Uh, he's, um, he's very gifted. Uh, you should read his books on the road. Uh, the last book he wrote uh, is a strange kind of autobiography, not really an autobiography in the formal sense, but he uh, talks about cities and people and the places that he's been. And I want to tell you that after reading it, I felt better about America and Americans. He's, he has that kind of radiance without being goody-goody. He's solid, he's down to earth, he uh, has humor, he's... I want to say one last parting thing. I mentioned to you earlier that I feel that you're performing a very important function, being friends of radio, to the extent of meeting regularly and paying dues, and... and uh, coming out for occasions like this. But there's a line of Whitman that applies here too. He wrote, to have great poets, you have to have great audiences. <laughs> and that's a very important trust. Thank you. Thank you.